الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين أما بعد The following hadith number 1108 he was on his way to visit Sa'ad ibn Ubadah. He passed by a meeting which included Abdullah ibn Ubay, Ubay ibn Salud. And that was... He passed by a gathering. He it's, passed it's, by it's, a gathering which included Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salud. And that was before the Abdullah announced, before the, uh, uh, Abdullah announced being a Muslim. The meeting contained a mixture of Muslims and Mushriks and idol worshippers. This hadith may cause some confusion because we stated in the beginning that salam should be given to Muslims only. And in the hadith, it says that the Prophet ﷺ passed by a gathering that contained a mixture of Muslims, Mushriks, and idol worshippers. Yet he stayed, he stated, he gave salam. So this is confusing. Now, we're supposed to finish early. So, Islamically, if we have two conflicting evidences, is it possible? Is it? It's from Allah. It can't be whether it's two verses of the Qur'an, then this means that there is a process we have to follow. The process states, whenever there are two evidences in Islam going against one another, we have to follow the following process. One, we have to try to reconcile between them. Why? Because when we reconcile, we apply both evidences rather than neglecting one over the account of the other. Give examples, Shaykh, and try to translate. Okay. Allah says in the Quran, حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمُ الْمَيْتَةُ وَالدَّمُ وَلَحْمُ الْخِنْزِيرِ It has been made prohibited upon you, the dead meat and the blood. Understood? The hadith the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam says, Uhillat lana maytatani wa daman. It has been made permissible for us two dead meats and two bloods. Now what we do? Allah says, it is made prohibited for you. And the Prophet says, it was made permissible for you. What to do? These are conflicting. Scholars say, Try to combine. How? By saying that this is a general prohibition. Every dead meat is haram. Every blood is haram to consume. Except the specific, the locust and the fish. This is dead meat. And the, spl uh, the sp uh, spleen and the liver. This is the blood. So anything that is dead, not slaughtered, is haram, except the locust. You know, the, it's not an insect, it's not an animal, it's in between. This is eaten, and it was eaten by the companions, and it's in Arabia, they still eat it, and they say it, it, it tastes good. I don't know, I've never tried it. I'm scared by just looking at it. And the fish. Seafood, any seafood, do you have to slaughter? Though it's dead. So if I see a fish floating on water and it's dead, can I eat it? There's no problem in eating it. It's halal, though it's dead. So this is number one. Whenever we have two contradicting, we try to combine both. If I am unable to reconcile, then I have to see if one abrogates the other. 
So I come to the verse of Quran. Allah says, وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَأَنْتُمْ سُكَارَى حَتَّى تَعْلَمُوا مَا تَقُولُونَ Do not pray until you are sober. Do not pray when you are in the state of intoxication until you are sober to understand what you say. And I come to another ayah. Allah says, verily, that gambling, intoxicants, etc., etc., are prohibited, so you have to avoid. Now, you have to avoid conflicts with it's okay to drink after Isha. Until Fajr, there is 8 10 hours, so get wasted. Fajr time comes, you're sober, you can pray. Alhamdulillah. So, what to do? Conflicting. It's very easy. I know that the last ayah that prohibits intoxications is abrogating everything that came before it. So this one is abrogated. And so many incidents in time, I can do this, but I have to know the timing, the dates. So if I have a conflicting two evidences that I cannot combine or reconcile, and I cannot know the dates to know which one abrogated which one. The third step is to try and see which one is more authentic. So if a verse of the Quran goes against a hadith and I cannot reconcile, I cannot know which one abrogated which one. In this case, I have to dismiss the hadith and apply the Quran. If two hadiths are conflicting, one is in Bukhari and one is in Sunan Ibn Majah. I know that Al-Bukhari is higher than Ibn Majah. So I take the one in Al-Bukhari. This is case or step number three. If I cannot reconcile and combine, and if I do not know which one came first, and if they are all in the same strength, in the same level, I cannot say that this one is stronger or more authentic than. Number four is I refrain from commenting. And I say I do not know. But definitely some of the scholars would have the answer. Personally, I do not have the answer. At the end of the day, these four steps to be followed means that I do not neglect the hadith the ayah, the evidence. I apply them all. Even if I fail to apply, I condemn my own thinking and logic. And I say that I do not know the scholars, some other scholars might know, and I wait for their clarification. So, we go back to this hadith. When we see that the Prophet والسلام, gave salam, to a mixture and he said himself in an authentic hadith do not initiate Jews and the Christians with salam and if you see them in a road or a way let them go to the sides of it force them to go to the sides of it this hadith is authentic do not initiate the greeting with the Jews and the Christians. And if you meet them in the street, push them towards the narrow part or the narrowest part of it. This hadith confused a lot of the Muslims. It's saying that the Prophet is ordering us to push them to the narrowest part of the road. How is this done? Those who do not have the good understanding of the Sunnah, they think that it encourages violence. So if I'm driving in the road and I see a Jew or a Christian, I chase him out of the road. And there is nothing that indicates this in the Hadith. The Hadith is simply addressing the issue of pride of a Muslim. Nowadays, the Muslims are so weak 
are so humiliated that when they see the Jews or the Christians, they bow down. If they come from the door and you are entering from it, what do they do? They open the door for them. Please, please come in. And this shows you how the Muslims are humiliated. The Prophet says, no, 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 no. You do not say salamu alaikum to them. You do not begin them with salam. This is discussed and we've gone through this, correct? The second part is that if you meet them in a narrow road, you push them to take the narrowest part of it. So, this is the path where I have to walk. And I'm walking. And the Jew or the Christian comes in my face. What do I do? The Prophet says, no, you do not do this. You're the proud one. You're the true Muslim who's worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal. What are you going to do? <laughs> you walk straight with your head high. He has to leave the way for you. If he doesn't, should I retreat? Why? One of us has to give way. Should it be me or him? You choose. Hmm. Who gives way? Him. Why me? Think about the situation. There is not a third way. Either, either you give way or he gives way. If you say, okay, I'll be the kind one. No, this is not kindness. This is humility. So if I'm entering from the door and he's coming in, if he comes first and opens the door and enters, okay, no problem. But if it's me and him, what should I do? I'm in the lift. And this Jew is next to me. There is a camera. Well, I cannot do anything in the lift. I wouldn't do anything anyway. So, we're in the lift. The door opens. Please. No. Walk. Akhi, always think of yourself not as of arrogance, as the pride of the deen, of the religion. This is a clear instruction from the Prophet ﷺ. Do not initiate salam. I used to work in a company, and the vice president of this company was a Maronet, Lebanese, Christian. And every time he enters my office, he says, Salamu alaikum, Sheikh Asim. And I say, Wa alaikum. Six, ten, twenty times, one day he entered the room, my office. He said, Salamu alaikum. I said, Wa alaikum. He said, Why don't you say Wa alaikum as salam? He was angered by it. He's an Arab. So I said, with a big smile, because you're a kafir. <laughs> Seriously. I said, You're Christian. I can say only wa alaikum salam to Muslims. But why are you angered by it? I always say good morning to you. So always have your pride as a Muslim coming first. So is this rude? No, it's not rude. It's sunnah. And sunnah is what defines what good is and what is bad is. Sunnah is what defines what is rude and what is not. Not the other way around. Sunnah judges others, not the etiquettes and um, whatever people believe judges my religion. So always have this yani, GPS clear to you, insha'Allah. The Prophet says in the hadith which was narrated by Bukhari and Muslim, whenever the people of the book say, Salamu alaykum, say, Wa alaykum, full stop. Do not say, Wa alaykum as salam, nor rahmatullah. You do not ask or pray uh, uh, for them. And this, yani, inshallah, um, is sufficient in order to finish in half an hour. Yes? Abdullah bin Dinar, Abdullah bin Dinar said, Abdullah bin Umar, radiallahu anhu, go to Abdul Malik. Abdul Malik. Abdul Malik. 
Abdul Malik bin Marwan in order to pledge him his allegiance. He wrote to him in the name of Allah, the merciful, the compassionate, to Abdul Malik, the Amir of Amir al Mu'minin from Abdullah ibn Umar. Peace be upon you, I praise Allah to you. There is no God but Him. I offer you obedience according to the Sunnah of Allah and the Sunnah of His Messenger as far as I can. This hadith comes under the title of How to Write Letters. So we see that the format here is in the name of Allah. So you begin your letters with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim or Bismillah. And then you say to and then from. And then you praise Allah Azza wa Jal and you say whatever you want to say. The same format was used by the Prophet والسلام, when he wrote to the Abyssinian, uh, no, to, the, to Hercules, uh, the ruler of Byzantium. The Prophet wrote to him والسلام, as follows. You know, there was a time where the Prophet والسلام, dispatched messengers with letters calling people to Islam. Like our Muslim rulers now, they they saying Donald Trump come to Islam. If you don't come to Islam, we will step in your stomach. And no, no. The Prophet did this, and he was in Arabia. He sent to the Persia Persian ruler. He sent to the Byzantian ruler. He sent to the Egyptian, to the Abyssinian, to all over the world for what? Calling them to Islam. This is what he wrote to Hercules the ruler of the Byzantines, in the name of Allah, the most compassionate, the most merciful. Same as this? Huh? Same. Like Ibn Umar wrote. Then he said, from Muhammad, the slave of the messenger of, uh, the slave and messenger of Allah, to Hercules, the ruler of Byzantium. <coughs> Same? Huh? Well, the people are asleep. Not the same. Here, Abdullah said to, from. But in the hadith, from, to. Why? Because the Prophet's name comes first. This is, I'm, I'm communicating with a kafir. I do not say to the kafir from a Muslim. No. From Muhammad, the slave and servant of Allah, the messenger of Allah, to the Hercules, the, the, the ruler of Byzantium. But when Abdullah ibn Umar is writing to the Khalifa, to the ruler, no, we honor the Muslim ruler. So he said, though he's not a companion, Abdullah ibn Umar is a companion, definitely greater than Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. Yet, because he is the ruler of the believers, he wrote to him his name first. Then the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, peace be upon you. What did the Prophet say? Peace be upon those who follow the true guidance. He did not say peace be upon you because he's not a Muslim. So when you address non-Muslims, you do not say peace be upon you. Peace be upon those, assalamu ala man al huda, those who follow the true guidance. And then he wrote to him the rest of the warning of the message that you know of. So this is the format that Muslims should use when writing emails. When write, of course, emails nowadays is different. The to and the from is already decided the subject. But you have to say, Assalamu Alaikum. Must we reply to the Salam or not? The majority say yes. When someone writes to you, Assalamu Alaikum, the majority say you must write, Wa Alaikum Assalam. Some scholars say written form is not like spoken form. Therefore, if you, like me, answer gazillion questions a day and everyone says, Assalamu Alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. To write the answer, it consumes few hours of my day. So it's not logical. 
especially on Twitter. People say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, and you have to go, alaikum assalam, the character is over. I cannot answer you. So I follow, I'm inclined to follow this opinion that in written form, you do not have to reply for the salam, but in verbal, definitely. Someone says, Assalamu alaikum, you say, have to say, alaikum assalam. The following hadith. Ibn Umar radiallahu said, the Prophet sallallahu said, none of you should make a man rise from his place. Stand up from his seat. Stand up from his seat. And it's, this is better translation than rise up from his place. Place meaning house, no, seat. This is what is intended. None of you should make a man rise up from his seat. Stand up. Stand up from his seat and then sit in it, but make room and spread out. Of course, before, people used to sit on the floor. So, that those who are arrogant would come and say, move, I want to sit here. I want to sit next to the sheikh. I want to sit next to the air condition. This breaks people's hearts. This is not proper. And Allah mentioned this in the Quran, where Allah says, O oh, you who believe, when you are told, space yourselves in assemblies. Then, uh, then make space, Allah will make space for you. إِذَا قِيلَ لَكُمْ تَفَسَّحُوا فِي الْمَجَالِسِ فَافْسَحُوا So you have to make room, rather than make someone get up and stand up and it is prohibited to make someone leave a seat for you. So I come, hey, move. I want to sit. This is haram. This is prohibited because it is a sign of arrogance and it is humiliating to the brother you are addressing. So the Islamic way is not to be selfish. I want to sit the hell with you. You go. I'm older. I am richer. I am this or that, I'm Sheikh, you go up. No, this is humiliating for the brother who you are asking him to uh, do this for you. Following hadith. Jabir bin Samura said, when we came to the... Samura. Samura. Samura, maybe you think it's from Samoa or something like this. Samura, Jabir bin Samura. Jabir bin Samura said, when we came to the... Prophet Samura, by the way, means what in Arabic? Ashabu Samra. Three. Three. When the Prophet ﷺ gave the pledge of Ridwan, Bayatul Ridwan, it was under the tree. Ashabu Samra. Hmm. When we came to the Prophet ﷺ, one of us sat at the edge of the group. This, by Jabir, may Allah be pleased with him, is telling us the way the companions used to sit. So, for example, I come and all the brothers are here. This is the gathering. When I come, I go and sit in the middle. Why? This is part of my arrogance. The companions, not only the companions, the Prophet himself, I saw. Whenever he entered, the first empty seat he would sit. Nowadays, the people are unlike this. When we enter a room or a big place, we look at the best position in the middle and we sit there. So we are at the center of attraction. And the hadith shows us that Muslims must not show off must not acquire and request fame. And this is why you sit wherever is available, not in the middle of the place. And this is why the Prophet says, alayhi salatu salam, avoid the places of slaughtering. What does that mean? Scholars say that the middle of the room, the Prophet is nicknaming it, place of slaughter because when you sit in the middle of the room all the attention is on you you are getting yourself slaughtered seeking fame 
getting yourself slaughtered. And the Prophet is prohibiting people to sit in the middle of the room so that they would not feel arrogant, so that they would not spoil their hearts because love of fame is destruction and a sign of insincerity. I told you this before, many times youngsters come to me and say, Sheikh, we would like to be famous like you. How, where to start? I say to them, the first thing you should do is leave. Why? Your intention is to be what? Famous, not to learn religion to be beloved by Allah Azza wa Jal. This means that you have insincerity. If you're focused to be famous, this means that you're not sincere. Your main focus, your main objective must be what? Must be that you seek Allah's pleasure, not to be famous. If not, then there is a problem in your sincerity. So many times we sit with brothers and they start to boast. Oh, Alhamdulillah, we prayed today so many prayers and MashaAllah, we give sadaqah and today I'm fasting, by the way. And uh, uh, we, we gathered in so much charity for orphanages and Alhamdulillah, we have three or four orphans we're supporting. And um, do you see that masjid over there? We participated in building it and, and so and so. So people show off with their good deeds and this is a sign of insincerity when you show off you want attraction you want people to give you uh, uh, fame and to acknowledge what you have done the prophet says in a scary hadith whoever whoever wears a garment of fame whoever wears a garment of fame in this dunya, Allah would put on him a garment of humility and disgrace on the Day of Judgment. What is the definition of a garment of fame, do you think? Hmm. What is a garment of fame? If I were to come here wearing a thobe of wool, and it is very cheap, smelly, and with holes in it. What would you say, the first impression, when you see me wearing it? Oh, what a righteous, pious person. You would think that I have left the dunya behind me and that I am only focused on reaching Jannah. This is a garment of fame. When you wear a certain attire, to prove that you are among the scholars. What do the scholars wear here? Azhari hat? Is it? So if I come tomorrow for a lecture and I wear the Azhari hat and the apron they're wearing with, you know, something, jacket or whatever, long jacket, and I pretend to be among the scholars and I'm not. This is a garment of fame. If someone drives a car and it's pink, what do you think yourself, Pink Panther? <laughs> and, and everybody is, oh, look. And when they say, do you know so-and-so? No, Yahi, the one with the pink car. Oh yeah, I know him. This is a garment of fame. People who do things to be noticed by, though they are weird, they are not common, they want to stand out in a crowd, this is a garment of fame. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, this is something that would take the people to hell. Very dangerous. And likewise, if you look at the times of the Salaf, Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, may Allah have mercy upon him, on his uh, uh, beautiful life, one of the greatest scholars of Islam, they said, Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, if he were at the time of the companions, he would be among the best of them. The companions did not have an edge over him except by looking at the Prophet. 
He was a whole rounded scholar of Islam. Jihad, wealth, knowledge of hadith, ibadah, the whole nine yards. In one of the battles against the room, against the, the Byzantines, they came asking for a duel and none of the Muslims came because the fighter was so strong. So one man on a horse came wrapping his face, only his eyes can be seen. And he went and fought this knight and killed him. Another knight came and killed him. A third knight came and killed him. Then the Muslims restored their confidence and they said, Allahu Akbar. No one knew him. So one of Abdullah ibn Mubarak's companion removed the cover on his face. And he recognized that it was Abdullah ibn Mubarak. What did Abdullah ibn Mubarak do? He said, may Allah have mercy on you. Are you among those who want to expose us? And he covered his face and ran away and joined the army. Why do you, a person does something like this? Because he wants to conceal his good deeds. We, on the other side, would like to, everyone know that, Alhamdulillah, I prayed Fajr today, MashaAllah, and yesterday I prayed Isha. MashaAllah, and inshallah after a while I will pray Maghrib. Allahumma lakal ham, Allahumma la riya. This is wrong. You have to be careful. And a sign of sincerity is that praising you does not add any value. And criticizing you does not sadden you. When you're criticized and you're saddened by it, you're not sincere. When you're praised and you're happy, yes, <laughs> I'm a good scholar, I'm a big scholar, mashallah, mashallah, and you're happy, this means that you're not sincere. It should be equal. Praising me, criticizing me, I don't give anything about it. <laughs> um, again, we must be careful. Instagram, Snapchat, social media, when you post things about yourself, asking for fame. You have Muslims doing heinous things just to get attraction, just to be famous. Do we have this in the Muslim world? A lot. And this takes you straight to hell. It was reported that a Bedouin came. One narration said he wanted to urinate in Zamzam well. Another narration said he came with filth wanting to put it on the Kaaba. They got hold of him. They beat the hell out of him and they took him to the Muslim ruler. So while he was standing in front of the Muslim ruler, the Muslim ruler said, Subhanallah, are you not Muslim? He said, yes, I am. He said, why did you do what you were going to do? He said, I wanted to be famous even if the people curse me. I wanted them to mention my name. So if I do something bad like this, they will say, oh, this so-and-so, may Allah curse him. Oh, famous. A lot of the Muslims are like this. They, they just want to be known. They just want to be famous. They do bad things just for their names to be mentioned. And this is a serious thing. Okay. Sayyid al-Makburi said, I passed by Ibn Umar radiallahu He was conversing with a man. I stood by them and he struck me on my chest and said, when you find two men conversing, do not go up to them nor sit with them until they give you permission. I said, may Allah correct you. May Allah forgive you. Yeah, but correct you. <laughs> the translation is out of context. May Allah forgive you. Aslahak Allah. May Allah Azza wa Jal Forgive you, may Allah amend your affairs, but not correct you. Hmm. May Allah forgive you, Abu Abdurrahman. I only wish to hear something good from both of you. I was only hoping to hear something good from both of you. This hadith is a beautiful etiquette. One would say, you say hadith, and there is no mentioning of the Prophet. This is hadith what? Mawquf, meaning that this is reported by the companion, not by the Prophet. So, 
Abdullah uh, ibn uh, Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, was talking with someone. And a third person came. So he pushed him in the chest. And he said, when two are conversing, this is something between them. You must not interrupt and come in between. Unless you seek their permission. So the man said, I only wanted to learn. Because if some, like now, since yesterday, I'm here. A brother comes with a problem. He's asking me privately. And then you get two, three brothers. Excuse me. What are you doing? Uh, maybe we'll hear hadith. Maybe we'll hear a good advice. Their intention is good. What is the feeling of the brother talking to me? Bad. So, um, okay, maybe I'll talk to you some other time. So, it is not permissible when two are speaking that you come and you eavesdrop or you want to participate without their permission. Ask for permission. They tell you it's okay. It's okay. They tell you, no, it's not okay, then you have to keep your distance until they are uh, through with this. Okay. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu said, uh, Anhu? Anhu. Yes, why? Uh, father, and father and son. So, Ibn Abbas, we don't say radiallahu anhu. Because his father is the uncle of the Prophet, so we say radiallahu anhuma. Abdullah ibn Umar, Ibn Umar, Abdullah and Umar. So they're both, we say, Radiallahu Anhuma. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, we say, Radiallahu Anhu. Because his father was not a Muslim, so we do not say this to him. Yes. Abdullah ibn Umar, Radiallahu Anhuma, said, The Prophet said, None of you should eat with his left hand, nor drink with his left hand. Shaitan eats and drinks with his left hand. Hadith is clear. Do we elaborate? Yes, please. He, narrate, uh, he the narrator, said, that the mother of Ibn Umar and his closest student used to add to this, and he should not take or drink with it. Okay. So the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ in prohibition of eating and drinking with the left hand. Nafi' added giving and taking also with the left hand. So let us quickly go through this. The majority of scholars say that this is not haram. This is not recommended. Why? Because they say that this is not anything logical for prohibition. So this is part of the akhlaq. And whatever is part of the akhlaq, it's recommended not Mandatory, it is makruh, not prohibited. <coughs> but Imam Nawawi, may Allah have mercy on his soul, said this cascades to anything that is good. So, for example, if you are wearing clothes or shoes or entering a masjid or doing siwak or combing your hair or giving salam from salat, Whatever you do, all of these, you use the right first. And for bad things, you use the left. Like when you take off the shoes, when you cleanse yourself from impurity, when uh, you leave the masjid, you leave with your left foot, etc. This is part of what the general trend in Islam is. To honor the right and the left is used for things that are disgraced or you do not honor them in terms of eating and drinking the most authentic opinion is that it is totally prohibited with your left hand why because clearly the prophet ﷺ told us that this is something that the shaitan does and whatever the shaitan does is prohibited for us. So eating and drinking must be with the right hand. The Prophet ﷺ was once eating food and with him was a child. And this child is Umar 
ibn Salamah. So the child was eating with his left hand. The Prophet ordered him والسلام, with the hadith that each and every one of you know. Ya ghulam, sammillah, kul bi yaminik wa kul mimma yalik. O child, say bismillah, kul eat from uh, with your right hand and eat from what's in front of you. So this is the Prophet's teaching alayhi salatu wasalam. In Sahih al-Imam Muslim, a man was eating with his left hand, a sandwich probably. The Prophet saw him and said, eat with your right hand. If it was not mandatory, the Prophet would have left him. So the man said, I cannot. Out of arrogance, the Prophet is telling him, eat with your right. The man said, I cannot eat. Meaning, there is a disability. I cannot use my right hand. The Prophet said, may you be disabled and unable to eat. So the man's hand became paralyzed. Sahih al-Imam Muslim. Because of his arrogance and refusal to accept the command of the Prophet والسلام, he was punished on the spot. Mother Aisha said, the Prophet's right hand sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to be used when making wudu for his food while his left hand was made for entering the toilet and whatever was uh, uh, harmful for uh, a human being. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu said, in the morning the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would say, Allahumma bika asbahna wa bika ansayna wa bika nahya wa bika namut wa ilayka nujub. O Allah, we enter the morning by you and we... Okay, we enter the morning by you. The translation is very bad, with all due respect. My translation is, O oh Allah, by your leave we have reached the morning. And by your leave we have reached the evening. By your leave we live and die, and unto you is our return. This is the most appropriate translation. By your leave we reach the level or the stage of the morning, not enter in the morning and exit from the morning. And the second part is, yes? In the, e in the evening he would say, Allah bika amsayna wa bika What is the difference? Here, in the morning we begin in the morning. In the evening we begin with in the evening. Hmm. Okay. We have we have reached the evening. We have reached the evening. By your leave, we have reached the morning. And by your uh, by your leave, we live. And by your leave, we die. And to you is our return. Our resurrection. Our so the return is there, and here is. Resurrection. طيب. Now, we can finish today's course by this hadith, but we have other hadiths. This requires a lot of time. The issue of adhkar. This is your antivirus, anti shaitan, anti evil eye, anti black magic, anti jinn possession. Your adhkar makes your protection with the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal. And the scholars have made a lot of books collecting adhkar. The most famous you all know of an nawawi called You guys are not real Shafi'i. Huh? Al-Adhkar. His book known as Al-Adhkar for Nawawi. Ibn Taymiyyah wrote Al-Kalim Al-Tayyib. Ibn Qayyim wrote Al-Wabil Al-Sayyib. And so on. There are so many publications collecting only the adhkar because the Prophet used to say a lot of them. 
And the more you memorize, the more protection you get and the closer to Allah Azza wa Jal. All these adhkar revolve around Tawheed. Shows the, your belief in Allah, shows your tawakkul on Allah. And this is why the Prophet والسلام, at the end of the day, <sighs> In the, where the, in the morning, we use the word nushur, that the resurrection. And in the evening, it is not resurrection, it is return. So it is more suitable to death. That is why you change. Nushur is a resurrection. When you wake up, you're resurrected from your death because you were, died, you, you were dead. The Prophet said, sleeping is the minor death. When we sleep, we die. We don't feel what's happening. And our souls go and leave our bodies. So this is resurrection when we wake up. But in the evening after Maghrib or after Asr, when we say we, to Allah, we, we will return because we are about to sleep. And this is our death. Also, uh, by your leave, we enter uh, to or we uh, what did we say uh, by your leave we have reached the morning whatever we do we are doing it with the leave of Allah if Allah doesn't allow us to attend this would we have attended it if Allah doesn't allow us to reach evening we would have died so it is a blessing that is continuous from Allah that we have reached this stage, that we have reached this level, that we wake up in the morning, that we go to bed in the evening, all is by Allah's leave. al said, al anhu said, when the Prophet wanted to go to sleep, he put his hand under his right cheek and said, Allah, Allahumma qini adabaka yawma tabaratu ibadah. O Allah, protect me from your punishment on the day you raise up your face. So this is one of the dua that you make before you go to sleep. The Prophet sleep was not like ours. Our sleep is total cutting off from this dunya. When we go to bed, خلاص, we don't think we have nothing to relate us from the responsibilities, from the trouble that we face. We cut ourselves totally off. The Prophet wasn't like this, alayhi salatu wasalam. Allah addressed him by saying, قُمِ اللَّيْلَ إِلَّا قَلِيلَ Arise to pray the night except for little. This is why he used to deal with sleeping as a form of worship. How is that? Before he sleeps, he makes wudu. And then he goes and sleeps on his right hand. Right side facing the Qibla. Like where? Like the graves. Anywhere you go in the world, you open the graves of the Muslims, they will arrest you. No, no, see. I'm not literally saying. If you look into the graves of a Muslim, you will find all Muslims on the right facing the Qibla. This is unity. Huh? Anywhere in the world. So when you die, this is what happens. When you sleep, you actually are preparing to die. And then the Prophet used to, alayhi salatu wasalam, recite great amount of dua to the extent that you most likely would fall asleep before completing it. I have listed maybe three pages here in front of me. I will not have time to do it. But Hadith al-Bara ibn Azib, this one, the Prophet said to him, when you take your leave to sleep, lie on your right after you perform wudu 
and then say Allahumma inni aslam tu wajhi ilayk wa wattu amri ilayk wa alja'atu dhahri ilayk rahbatan wa rahbatan ilayk la malja'a wa la manja minka illa ilayk Allahumma amantu bi kitabika alladhi anzalt wa bi nabiyika alladhi arsalt number one then the prophet I will not translate because this will take us to uh, forever and number one the prophet used to say Allahumma bika aw bismika ahya wa amut this is well known to you Number three, the Prophet says, alayhi salatu wasalam, Bismika rabbi wada'atu jambi, wa bika arfa'uhu, in amsakta nafsi farhamha, when arsaltaha fahfadha bima tahfadu bihi ibadaka salihin. And he used to clean his bed, and this is scientifically proven, bed bugs. Whenever you leave your bed and come back, with the tip of your cloth or with your pillow or with something you have to three times hit your bed because the prophet justified this you don't know what came after you have moved from it whether jinn whether insects whether bug so by doing this you clean it and say this dua uh, then the prophet used to do a number of things والسلام, he used to recite surat tabarak Surat Alif Lam Mim As Sajda, Surat Az Zumar, Surat Bani Israel Al Isra. You're talking about one and a half juzu. People say, Akhi, when I say, Qul huwa Allah wahad, I'm dead, I'm tired. Not only that, he used to cup his palms, blow. Then recite, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٌ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ Then wipe every part possible of his body. Then cup his hands again. Blow and recite again the three surahs. And do that again and do that for the third time. Very little of the people do it nowadays. One of the brothers, I say, do you do it? <laughs> this is, I cannot. Why? He said, it looks silly. Subhanallah. This is your protection, Wallah. Allah protects you. Allah gives you a healthy body. You look at the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ like this, people are, are, are strange. They leave the sunnah out of shyness. Tell them, come here, yakhi. come, recite the Quran. Oh, no, 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 I cannot. You go to the masjid. You find, mashallah, 50, 70 people. Assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum salam. Did the mu'adhan come and give adhan? No, akhi, seven minutes ago the adhan was due. Why didn't you go and make adhan? <laughs> I'm shy. Shy? People are shy to make adhan. But if they were invited to Asia, got talent, or the voice, and mashallah, they hold the microphone like Elvis Brigley. Elvis Presley, in Arabic we say Arfis <laughs> Brijli, means I kick with my foot. So they manipulate his name. Oh, poor guy is dead, khalas, he's rotten. Rotten roll. Uh, anyhow. Uh, okay, so we have this and also part of the etiquette of dua, subhanallah, 33 times, alhamdulillah, 33 times, Allahu Akbar. 34 times the Prophet said to Ali and Fatima, this is better for you than a servant. I mean, Taymiyyah says, whoever maintains this dhikr, Allah would give him the strength during the daytime to work more than if he had a servant. Alhamdulillah. So also he used to say whenever he went to bed, Alhamdulillah, alladhi at'amana. وصاق وسقانا وكفانا وآوانا فما فكم من من لا كافي له ولا مقوي. Also he used to say اللهم رب السماوات والأرض ورب العرش العظيم ربنا ورب كل شيء فارق الحب والنوى منزل التوراة والإنجيل والفرقان أعوذ بك من شر كل شر ذي شر أنت آخذ بناصيته اللهم أنت الأول فليس قبلك شيء وأنت الآخر فري الآخر فليس بعدك شيء وأنت الظاهر فليس فوقك شيء وأنت الباطن فليس دونك شيء اقض عنا الدين وغننا من الفقر أخي this is what this is before going to bed on bed 
And one says, Sheikh, if I say this, I cannot see the nine o'clock news. I have to be in bed after Isha immediately. This is what's connecting you with Allah. When you have little connection, you don't say these adhkar. And there are so many, many more, but the time does not permit us. So what to do? Ya Sheikh Farid, do you have Husn al-Muslim? You, I think you got your free copy, huh? Is it free? Free, well, free, alhamdulillah. So, memorize it. It was free? And now? <laughs> but memorize it. It costs what? Maybe five ringgits, three ringgits. In Saudi, come to me, we give it free. In Arabic. Memorize it because this protects you from all evil. Gives you connected to Allah Azza. Wajal. The following hadith. Case number 800. Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhu said, The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Lock the doors, tie the water skins, turn over the vessels, cover the vessels, and put out the lamps. Shaitan does not open a locked door, nor untie a water skin, nor uncover a vessel. A mouse can cause a house to burn down with its inhabitant in it. S Satan change it with the devil, as indicated earlier. So, the hadith has a number of issues that we cannot cover full, fully, but we'll give you yani, a preview, inshallah, that would do the job. It connects you to the world of the unseen. Why? Because it talks about the effect of shaitan, of the devil upon us. Do we, say, do we see the devil? Every time when I wake up next to me, Sheikh. <laughs> no, no, be, be fair, be fair. Maybe when you look at the mirror? Maybe. So, we don't see the devil. Do we believe in his existence? Definitely. Do we believe in the existence of angels? Most surely. But we as believers believe in the unseen. So the Prophet is telling us alayhi salatu wasalam, that you must do the following things which are first lock the doors, tie the water skins because they used to have the water in, water skins and it can be open. So you have to tie it so nothing would come in or penetrate it. Cover or turn over the vessels. But if there is food in it, so this is indicating what kind of vessels? Empty one. But if there is food in it, what to do? Cover it and put out the lamps. These lamps? No, the lamps that are made with fire. In another hadith, because the devil comes to the mouse, and it orders the mouse to carry a thread or a piece of rope, light it, and then burn your house. Authentic hadith. This is why we're ordered to kill mice. In Islam, it is a must that you kill mice. A lot of the Muslims now have hamsters in their homes. So, Sheikh, this is not a mouse. What is it, a cat? <laughs> This is one of the type of mice. When they, they, mashallah, wash it, bathe it, and use the hair dryer, and mashallah, tabarakallah. So, these are the things. Shuf, the Prophet says, a mouse can cause a house to burn down with inhabitants in it. Why? Because the devil does this to it. The devil orders it to do this. And... Some people, when they come only to read this hadith, think that they have to do this throughout the day. This is not true. This is only restricted to what? To the night. And there are other etiquettes, such as do not send your children out between Maghrib and Isha. This is restricted time for children to go out because the devil spread. But if the children are accompanied, by an adult, no problem. A lot of the brothers, sister was called me complaining. Sheikh, I'd like to eat outside. My husband doesn't allow me to go. I say, let's go and eat. And he says, no, no, it's time of restriction. 
and he refuses to go. And I said, your husband is very knowledgeable. This restriction is for children. Adults can go out. <laughs> the brother is taking this as an excuse. Let's go. Says, no, 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 haram, haram, haram. <laughs> do not, and she's saying, do not attend Sheikh Hasim's class because you learn these things from him. So this is restricted to nighttime. Why? The Prophet told us, alayhi salatu wasalam, among the things that he had told us, that the shaitan, though the devil has powers to do things that we cannot imagine, Allah deprived shaitan from certain powers. Among them, if the door is locked, especially when you mention the name of Allah, he cannot open it. As in the hadith we mentioned earlier with the food, the dinner and etc. Also the water skins. He would like to introduce illnesses, diseases to you. He can penetrate our bodies, but not do these things as a sign from Allah that he is weak and that he cannot do except what Allah allows him to do. Following hadith. Ibn Abbas said, the Prophet commanded that a whip should be hung inside the house. A whip? What is a whip? Whip, stick. Now this hadith is strange to some. Did the Prophet ever beat a woman or a child? Never. So when the Prophet tells you to hang the whip, is he ordering you to beat your children? No. But this sign of hanging it up gives the idea that it can be used. Which means that the Prophet is telling us, you have to take care of your children. You have to bring them up. Not necessarily beat them, but at least show them that there is the stick as well as the carrot. So you use both things in order to upbring them in the best of fashion. And as I said, nowadays we're intimidated. If you live in Europe, you can't even hang a whip. You're, 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 no, it will not be fine. Your child will just put it on Instagram and the police would see it and they would arrest you for intimidating child, child abuse, etc. And you'll be extradited. Tay. The following hadith. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu said, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, when you hear the cooing of a cock in the night, it has seen an angel. Ask Allah. So, ask Allah. So, add so. Because this is a statement. The conclusion is, so, ask Allah. So, ask Allah for his blessing. If you hear the brain of a donkey in the night, it has seen Satan, so seek refuge. Had seen the, the devil, so seek refuge with Allah from, from the devil. Okay, these are again part of the unseen. So the Prophet is telling us, Alaihissalam, throughout the night, when you hear the rooster, and usually the rooster works 24 hours, usually one and a half hour before Fajr, the rooster starts to make adhan. Seriously, this, the, the, in Arabic it's called adhan, adhana, adik, saha, adik. The Prophet tells us, ask Allah from his blessings, from his favors. Why? Because the roaster saw an angel. And when you ask Allah, the angel would relay what you have asked Allah to Allah Azza And this is one of the time of answering your dua. The opposite is when you hear the donk bray. The donk, the donk. I, I dropped the Y, sorry. The donkey bray. What is bray? One of the brothers who was a supervisor in my English department, he went on a scholarship to America. So the teacher told him, talk. To us he was doing his masters so he's talking in, in America teacher and students we Muslims believe in Allah we have the pillars of Islam she says okay tell us more 
He said, we pray five times a day. <laughs> now the, the teacher is smart. She is a teacher. She wants to teach him. He said, ah, why do you do this? She says, he says, ah, this is my religion. I'm proud of my religion. I pray. She says, you alone or all Muslims? He said, all Muslim ummah. 1.7 billion pray. So he kept on repeating it, repeating it. After 10 minutes, she said, thank you, sit down. She wrote on the blackboard, pray is a form of worship. Bray is for donkeys. <laughs> Therefore, your pronunciation is extremely important. So the prophet is telling us that when a donkey brays, when you hear the sound of a donkey, this is because it's so a devil. So what do you do? Seek Allah's refuge from Shaitan. And I have prepared a long list, but uh, of the connection between angels and us. There is a very big connection between us and the angels. Since what? Since before we were born. When we were four months in our mother's wombs, old, 120 days, the angel comes, Oh Allah, should I write him as a righteous or as a, 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 someone who's not righteous? Is he to be a happy one or an evil one? What is his lifespan? What is his provision? What is this and that? So the relationship comes very early. Even the relationship with shaitan is very early, before even you were created. If a man sleeps with his wife without saying the dua, shaitan is participating in it. You have to say, Bismillah, Allahumma jannibna shaitan, wa jannibish shaitana ma razaqtana. If you don't, he participates with you. So, it's everywhere. We eat, he eats with us. If we don't say Bismillah. We use our left hand, he uses it and benefits from it. The angels, Ask Allah for forgiveness. May Allah Azza wa grant you a righteous wife and to you as well. Your wife hits you. Everything is interconnected with the, with the jinn, with the angels. And we have to have knowledge in order to be able to do this. Following hadith. I took Abdullah bin Salah and who the Prophet the day he was born. The Prophet was wearing a woman's robe and smiling one of his family to start. He said, He asked, Do you have any dates with you? I said, Yes. I gave him some dates. He chewed the dates and opened the child's mouth and put some uh, chewed dates into the child's mouth. The child licked his lips. The Prophet said, The Ansar loved dates and he named him, named him Abdullah. This hadith is talking about an etiquette of dealing with new, newly born children. How old? Few hours. What is the etiquette called? In Arabic, it's called? Masha Allah, The people in Arabia don't know it. You guys have, it's called tahnik. And hanak in Arabic is the sealing of your mouth. This is called hanak. And tahnik is to eat not a full date, a small tiny bit of it, chew it really well, and then take it and put it in the ceiling of the infant's uh, uh, um, uh, mouth, providing that this is few hours after the child's birth, preferably to be the first to uh, uh, enter its mouth. Why? Nowadays, medical doctors have proven that this is part of the best things for a child because they said that one of the biggest causes of death among newly born is the lack of glucose in the blood. This is what causes the child to be blue when he comes out. There is no glucose in the blood and also it causes difficulties in breathing and extractions in the uh, uh, muscles, not extractions, uh, uh, what do you call the opposite of extractions? Relaxation, too, too much relaxation. So they said that one of the main reasons of 
uh, fatality in newly born is the lack of glucose, which is totally avoided by this action of the Prophet ﷺ. These are medical, Western medical uh, um, reports proving it. Subhanallah. Dates is the best. If not possible, rutab, which is the ripe dates. If not possible, then even a tiny bit of honey would do, insha'Allah. Okay. Sa'id ibn Dumeir radiallahu anhu said, Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu said about the words of Allah, the mighty and exalted. There are people who buy diverting talk. Okay, the, the, the ayah I will recite it because the translation used is not the most authentic. We usually refer to Sahih International. So the ayah, you can compare what I'm saying to what you read on uh, the monitor. The best translation would be, and of the people. And of the people is he who buys the amusement of speech to mislead others from the way of Allah without knowledge and who takes it in ridicule. Those will have a humiliating punishment. This ayah is in Surat Luqman. And it talks about what? About singing. In the previous scholars' generations, singing was referring to musical instruments. Not, and this is why a lot of confusion is among the jurors on the ruling on singing. Singing lyrics without musical instruments is like poetry. We spoke about poetry early in the morning. If you sing good poetry, even with rhyme, if you say, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah, this is not music, this is singing. And as long as the words are good, having below this singing or chanting is no problem. The biggest problem is with musical instruments and the consensus of the four schools of thought, Abu Hanifa, Malik, Shafi'i, and Ahmad ibn Hanbal, all agree that is prohibited. No exception except for the duf. What is the duf? It is like the tambourine without the metallic pieces and can be used only in weddings when someone dignitary comes from a, a traveling or in Eid. Full stop. So any type of musical instrument is totally prohibited. So whether it is strings, guitars, violin, tuba, or brass, saxophone, um, I don't know, trumpet, whatever. All of these haram. Nowadays they don't have neither. They have synthesizers. So one keyboard does all the job for you. It is still haram. And the evidence behind this is so plenty. I don't have time and I enjoy talking about this because it has been discussed gazillions of times. The Prophet ﷺ prohibited in the Sahih al-Bukhari, the verses of the Quran, Surat Luqman, Surat al-Isra, Surat al-Najm, it is mentioned that it is haram, the companions of the Prophet, etc., the full uh, thing, all says that it is haram. Now, in our lives, what, what are you going to do? Are you going to continue doing what you're doing? Music in your car, music in your home, music in your malls, music in your own shop. The shop is yours, yet still you are playing music. Why? Sheikh, everybody's doing it. I'm coming to buy jeans and you're playing music. He said, yeah, if I don't play music, nobody would come and buy jeans. This is ridiculous. You have to have Islam. Music is haram, it's sinful. It is another issue if you tell me I am sinful and I'm listening to music, may Allah forgive me. But it is a problematic when it comes and you say, no, it's not haram. We have scholars listening to music. We have scholars dancing. One of the brothers came to me and said to me, this swirling. Huh? They said Abu Bakr used to do it. I said, what are you talking about? 
Yes, they say these people are crazy. They say that when Abu Bakr gave all of his money to the Prophet والسلام, and he's penniless now, he started swirling. Wallahi, this is so pathetic. They, when you see them do this, you think, well, what is this? A washing machine? <laughs> what are they doing? Helicopter, they're trying to fly. They say this is part of the religion. They use music. They dance to music. All of this is not part of our religion. So we will not take much time on it. You all know that it's haram. What is your stance? Minimize it. Mute it. Some of the brothers, they've come so much accustomed to it. This is how shaitan starts. Music, haram. Good. One year, two year. Music, haram. Good. Third year, I'd like to watch some news. Is it okay, Sheikh? Yes, it's okay. As long as there is no women, no music. Okay. So he mutes it. And when they speak, unmute. The beginning, mute. In the end, mute. After a few months, this is becoming too much. It's costing me battery. Ever ready battery is very cheap. Put Dorset. It lasts longer. The Energizer Bunny keeps on. Okay. So after a while, khalas, it, he accustomed to it. Shaitan used step by step. After a while, even if women come, you have the first gaze. What are you doing? I'm, I'm not blinking. Oh, I blinked, khalas. This is the first. Haram. But we don't pay any attention. If you don't have good companions to advise you, to remind you, to always bring you back to Allah, you will feel you will fall straight into the traps of shaitan. And it begins by little, little by little. And if you compare your iman with three or four years ago, Allah I have changed. I have changed a lot. I used to be stronger than this. I used to observe salah in the first row. Now, if I pray in the second jama'ah, okay, no problem. If I miss everything, as long as I'm praying on time, you have to rectify these things. No one will come with a stick and force you to do it. If you're alone, then may Allah be with you. Yalla. Abu Huraira anhu said, that Abu is not from the same now this hadith is one of the signs of the prophethood he was given the concise of speech he says one word you write volumes out of this look at this a believer is not bitten from the same hole twice easy what does it mean there was a man who was captured by the Muslims on the Battle of Badr. So the Prophet, when they captured him, he pleaded guilty. He cried, Oh Prophet of Allah, I have children. I have a family. Please set me free. I will never ever fight against you. I will never be an enemy of Islam. Prophet being who he was, set him free. The minute the man went to Mecca, he started making a scene out of it. I laughed on Muhammad. I fooled him. I did this and this. And he started writing poetry against Islam, the women of Muslims, about mocking the Prophet. ﷺ. One year later, he was captured in battle, the battle of Uhud. And he started weeping again. Oh, Prophet of Allah, I have children, leave me. The Prophet told him, A believer is not written from the same hole twice. I will not set you free. So you go to people of Mecca and mock again. He ordered him and he was beheaded. So this shows you that the moral, there is so much to the hadith. I cannot, I do not have time. But the moral of the hadith is that a real believer learns from his mistakes. You should not be bitten from the same hole again. You should not fall in the same sin over and over again. Isn't it strange when we walk and we step on something that is slippery? 
if we step on something that is slippery and we don't pay attention to it and we slip, what is the first thing we do? Look at what made me slip. Why? So that I do not fall in the same mistake again. However, when it comes to sin, we fall over and over and over and never learn. So many times I observe people to learn. And I say, subhanAllah, how shaitan laughs on us. I see a brother holding a cigarette, taking a lighter, 50 times, it doesn't work. Does he learn from his mistake? He says, oh, Alhamdulillah, Allah has saved me from the cigarette. I'm not gonna smoke again. He tries 50 times and it doesn't work. He goes and beg, Akhi, light please, can please. Begging people never learns. A believer is not bitten from the same hole twice. We're bitten 50 times and we never learn. Carry on. Hmm? Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu said, some people said, Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we feel in ourselves something that we do not want to speak about. Even if we were to receive everything that the sun shines on, he asked, have you really felt like that? Have, have you really found that? Have you really found that? Mm -hmm. Have you really found that? They said yes. He said that is clear to me. This hadith is dealing with OCD. This hadith is dealing with waswasa. Now, I, pff, there's so much into it, but we have to wrap it up before they kick us out. Waswasa is from shaitan or not? People come to me, say, Shaykh, I have so many bad and negative thoughts about Allah that I cannot speak. It's killing me. So I tell him, speak it out, tell me. He said, I cannot. Come on, tell me. He said, I cannot. This is the biggest sign of Iman. You're a believer. And this is why you're unable to say it, because you're a believer. If you were not a believer, you would have spilled it out to me. So the Prophet ﷺ said that this is a clear belief. How can it be a clear belief if I'm getting these negative thoughts? Because you're unable to speak it out. And this is why Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, his companions came to him and they were complaining. They say, Ibn Abbas, the Jews are making fun of us. He said, why? They said that you Muslims whisper in your prayers. For us Jews and Christians, we have no problem. We never whisper in our prayers. Ibn Abbas said, true. This is correct. Shaitan. What is he going to do with a corrupt heart? The Jews are already corrupt. They're already kafir. Why would he whisper to them? If you are a burglar and there is a peasant house and there is a big castle, which one would you go and steal from? The money is. You will not go to the peasant house. You would put a check probably say, well, I'm sorry. Well, I didn't know that you were this poor. He's sadaqah for you. <laughs> so... This is a clear Iman when you fight with Swas. Shaitan comes only to the heart with Iman. So he gives you a Swas. You fight, he increases. So what to do? You give up, he wins. So you are on your path and eventually he fights you, increases in your uh, Swas and you fight him until you come to the fork of the road. Then either you follow shaitan or you keep on fighting. Once you keep on fighting and you reach a level of Iman, shaitan says, oops, leave him. The more we fight, the more we give uswas, he increases in Iman. This guy is going to be a companion. Leave him. Seriously. So he leaves you for three, four months. Once you don't have the uswas, what happens? Grows really go down, go down, go down. Let's go. They start work on you. So it's a constant struggle between you and shaitan. You have to think, sit back, analyze, and realize that he's not giving me good advice. 
This is not a malak. He's not an angel who's advising me. This shaitan is making fun of me. Why are you making wudu five times? Sheikh, every time I wash, I get this feeling that I am not clean. Who is giving you this feeling? Angel? Mm, no. Who? Shaitan, khalas, you know. But I cannot. No, you have to. Now you know who is driving you. You draw the line and stop. Following hadith. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the fitr of natural state consists of five. Circumcision, shearing the pubic hair, plucking the armpits, trimming the mustache, and cutting the nails. Now this hadith has so much into it. But again, we have to cut it short. Fitrah is comp uh, 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 fitra in Arabic means the natural thing. And it has two meanings. Originally, the internal fitrah, which is Islam. Fitratullahi allati fatara nasa alayha la tabdila li khalqillah. This is Tawheed. All of the humans are born upon Tawheed. Ishhada. And if I get an infant and say, Man Rabbuk, he said Allah. No. Meaning that if any newborn was left alone without any effect or influence from the environment, he will grow up to know that Allah is the creator. He will not know Asma al Sifat, Tawheed al Rububiyyah, but he has this inner built in feeling of fitrah. The hadith is talking about the external fitrah. And he, the Prophet ﷺ is telling us about five essential and important things. First of all, circumcision. Circumcision is mandatory upon male. And it is disputed upon among the females. And the most authentic opinion, it is recommended, but not mandatory. And nowadays, nobody does it usually. Uh, secondly, shaving the pubic area. This is for both men and women, and this is mandatory because this area is a place where a lot of filth and najasa is. Thirdly, plucking the armpit, whether you pluck it directly or you use some chemicals or you use anything that uh, does this. And also Imam Shafi'i said, even if you shave it, it does the job, but plucking it is better. And finally, clipping the nails, which is something that a lot of the Muslims do not do, especially women. Women now, a days, are like beasts, like lions and lioness. They prolong their nails, not this much, yani, and they put blood on them. So when you see her, you are intimidated. Unfortunately, it's even worse nowadays among the practicing Muslim women. How, ya Sheikh? You find the hijabi woman, once she gets her monthly period, she starts to put in polish nail, indicating that I'm not praying. What are you doing? A Muslim sister is not allowed to adorn herself where none mahram can see. And this is part of adorning or not? You have to wear gloves. Oh, Sheikh, then I will not put anything. Okay, Zakil Khair. Following hadith. Uh, some of the gents, on the contrary, in Arabia, I don't know here, we have a problem in, with the, some of the brothers. This finger only, you would find the nail this long. The rest, the nine are all cut. What is this? Sheikh, sometimes I scratch my hair, sometimes I pick my nose, sometimes I help with my wife with the vegetables. <laughs> this is totally unacceptable for a Muslim. It is a sign of a good Muslim to have always his nails clipped and short. Man or woman? Go ahead. Habib ibn Abi Jahid said, when a man spoke, his standing to one particular man was not like... I will, I, will, I will translate. Huh? The companions huh, liked when a man spoke that he does not address one particular person, but rather look at them all. 
This is the easiest way of understanding the hadith. Easy translation. What does it mean? The companions, I'm speaking to a gathering. Sometimes when I address, I address the brother. So this is all the course is about and the hadith is... The companion said, hey, what is this? He's talking only to this man. They did not like this. They liked it that a Muslim, when he speaks, he addresses everyone and looks at everyone, not a specific one. This is to make them all feel equal and as important. The following hadith. So this hadith is about bashfulness. We've spoken about this. What this hadith highlights is how strict the companions were May Allah be pleased with them in defending the Sunnah. So the Imran is saying something related to the Prophet and Bashir or Bushair is commenting and saying, no, modesty is not that. Yani, because in the books of wisdom, some of it can be good, some of it can be bad. And Imran was angered by this. I say, the Prophet say, and you say, my books of Bible, Old Testament, New Testament say this. And this is a trend among the scholars among the companions. They used to be defending the Sunnah. Abdullah ibn Umar ibn al-Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, was narrating. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, do not prevent women from going and attending salah in the masjid. His son, Bilal, said, by Allah, we will prevent them. Because he saw that the women were taking advantage of it. Abdullah ibn Umar, cursed him and said bad words to him. No one ever heard him say such words. He said, I tell you, the Prophet said, do not prevent them. And you said, we will prevent them? Go, I, by Allah, I will not speak to you. And he never spoke to him until he died. Who is he? His own son, his own flesh and blood. Why? Because he rejected out of goodwill. And he didn't reject the hadith of the Prophet, but he wanted to save the women from going into bad ways. So he said what he said, but this was unacceptable by Abdullah ibn Umar. Following hadith. Let me interpret it from my side. Love the one you love without going to extreme. For someday he may become one whom you hate. And hate the one you hate without going to extremes. For one day, he may, he may become one whom you love. And this is one sound advice. We have to be moderate in our feelings. I know sisters who come and complain. When I sit with their husbands, I find out why. The husband says, Sheikh, my wife loves me so much, she almost prostrates to me. But the minute I make one mistake, she gets the shotgun and wants to put me in front of a firing squad. This is found in men as well. There are people who have deficiencies in their feelings. Either they love 100% or they hate the same person 100%. This hadith of Ali is words of wisdom. When you love someone, love them, but in moderation. Because you never know, someday they will be your enemy. Which means, if I take the brother as someone I love, I don't give him all of my secrets. By the way, I love you. Farid does this and this, this does and this. But I love you, I trust you. Someday, tomorrow, he becomes my enemy. What happens? He spoils all my relations with the others. And likewise, if I hate the brother, keep the returning ticket, huh? Keep the return and take it back. Maybe he becomes a friend of mine. So if he becomes a friend of mine tomorrow, he still has scars in his heart because I was so bad when he was my enemy that these scars may not heal ever. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. And with this, we come to the conclusion of this blessed workshop. I will not lie. I, don't, I cannot say that I enjoyed it. I cannot say, but I'm not going to say I didn't. I, I enjoyed it, alhamdulillah. Your company was uh, uh, heart enlightening. And uh, I enjoyed every moment of it. And I pray to Allah that he makes my deeds sincere for his sakes and yours. And that we benefit from what we have 
heard and learned and that Allah grant us the will to implement it and to call others to it and by this we will be the winners inshallah in this life and in the hereafter.